Hey, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Think Business Exclusives, Getting to the Soul of Business. Um, this series is a limited series that I am doing uh, with um, just people who are making a difference in the world, and we're getting a little bit deeper than typical episodes of Think Business. And I'm honored um, to interview today's guest, Joshua Green. Uh, Joshua, it's a it's a pleasure to be connected with you uh, through our mutual friend, uh, Paul Kasheri. Uh, I'm grateful for that introduction. And I'm grateful to be talking about the what we're talking about today. Um, we're gonna be talking a lot about you um, and your most recent book and a lot of the other things that you have done, your most recent book, um, The un Unbelievable True Story. Um, it's called Unstoppable. Um, Siggy Wilzig's astonishing journey from Auschwitz survivor and penniless immigrant to Wall Street legend. Um, we're going to talk a lot about that book. I want to give a, a quick kind of review on you. You're a popular lecturer on Holocaust history and an author whose biographies have sold more than half a million copies worldwide. We'll get into a lot of other elements of you. Um, but I'm really drawn to ask the question on how does someone um, become drawn to write about the Holocaust and the people in the Holocaust? Because that is not easy writing. I would imagine it's not easy research. And, um, and, and, and what, what in your soul draws you, attracts you to that to that period of, of, of life. Right. Uh, you're asking a lot on a first date. So <laughs> um, you know, there's different levels of answering that question. The first level is that I was teaching philosophy in yoga studios for many years. That's my background is the devotional culture of India called bhakti, the devotional yoga tradition. And people would come up to me and say, you know, you're such a spiritual guy. How do you reconcile your purposeful vision of the universe with what happened in Europe 70, 75 years ago? How do you do that? And I didn't have a very good answer. You know, I mean, my grandmother was the, was only, was one of two who survived in her family of about 20 from Poland. But it wasn't part of my upbringing. I didn't think about it that much. We didn't talk about it ever. So I didn't really have an answer to that, that question. And uh, my wife's late father, Alan Fortunoff, endowed the Yale University Holocaust video archive. And he asked me back in the late 90s if I'd help them with some work they needed. I had some, a background in film, and uh, that kind of got me started. Um, what I discovered there was that video testimony is an important balance to paper documentation. Uh -huh. It is said that papers don't bleed. The video testimony of survivors is the most effective, the most powerful way of bringing those of us who were not there inside the experience of those who were, and it's, it can be transformative. Uh, that's, that's the most reasonable answer, I think. Yeah. I want to, I want to dive into, you know, something that you said, um, you have this, um, you know, this deep spiritual piece of, of, of your DNA, of your soul, your teaching, and somebody asked you a question, you did have the answer. And so a lot of times I think people, if they don't have the answer, they'll look ish maybe for it. Um, but you, you really dove in. And so what was it about not having the answer to these questions? Right. Cause you could have easily said, I don't know, you know what, maybe do some research and let me know. <laughs> right. Give right. Me a call figure this right. Give me a call when you figure it out, because <laughs> You know, uh, you know, I, I, I'll say I think most of the people who listen know that I am Jewish. I do have family that were Holocaust survivors. Um, so this is very near and dear to my heart. And um, but I am I am curious, you know, what what drove you even 
in a, an, on a deeper level to continually chisel away mm -hmm. at this mm -hmm. answer. Yeah. Um, my good fortune was to have been raised by a mother who was a very progressive thinker, someone who was, you might say, liberated before that was chic and who really wanted me to have a good education. So she sent me to an ethical culture school here in New York in the Bronx. There's a school called Fieldston. Ethical culture, you might describe as a non-theistic um, religion. Uh, it's a belief in humanity. It's a belief in the potential for humans to reach higher stages of evolution in thinking and compassion and behavior in the world. And yet the history of the world is really quite different. The history of the world is not a history of compassion. And in particular, Holocaust is, is a failure of the human condition. And uh, because I had always been encouraged to, to think big and to dig deep uh, it puzzled me. I didn't know yeah. what to make of that. And I think in, in some indirect way, it might have led to me at the age of 19, moving into a Hindu ashram and living 13 years in a kind of monastic environment, uh, which really set me on a course for the rest of my life. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, George Harrison and I studied with the same yoga teacher and I wrote a biography of George as a thank you for his encouragement. And I, that was that yeah. was a big part of my early life. I want to talk about that George Harrison um, piece um, that you wrote, but I also I want to dive into before we go there and your thirteen year journey. Tell me about your mom. Hmm. Um, I think, I, but I but I'd like you to touch on is you know we all have I think you know my mom was a not only a, a great friend and a mother, but a, a, but a, but a huge mentor, you know, and, and moms, moms are just different than dads. They, they plant mm -hmm. different seeds. And so, yeah. you know, tell me, you know, tell me about your mom and, and the influence she had then and the influence she had in, in hindsight, has in hindsight. Yeah. Um, she died last October, a year ago. I'm sorry. This month. Thank you. Um, she was 95 and did not have one regret in, in her body. She was thrilled with her life. And uh, when she passed away, um, I had arranged, it was just the two of us. I was at her apartment when she passed away. And there was a recording of nature sounds, birds and a kind of babbling brook and gentle rainfall. On another CD player, I had uh, mantras, Sanskrit mantras, chants going. And around her neck, I put um, wooden, a mala, a Tulsi mala, sacred beads, and uh, sprinkled some Ganges water on her head. Mm. And uh, she she left like the yogis. She, she had decided it, it, it didn't make sense to just live inside a machine that kept breaking down all the time. So we met with a hospice care person who said, you know, the only legal way you could do this is called VS uh, ED. What is that? Voluntary stopping of eating and drinking. As soon as she heard that, her eyes got big. She, that was it. That meeting with that hospice person was on Monday. And she was gone on Sunday. Mm. She stopped eating and drinking and went into what I can only describe as a kind of samadhi state. Yeah. Um, it was a beautiful thing to see. Mm. That sounds beautiful. It sounds so sacred. Yeah. Yes, it was. Yeah. <laughs> it was a, in, in India, they would call it an auspicious, auspicious passage. Mm. <laughs> That's beautiful. So how does, how does a, a Jewish kid from the Bronx end up with such intense in-depth spiritualness like you have where did that begin well i mean if i were going to be cute about it i'd say many lives back mm -hmm. um, well I, i'm i'm a big believer in that so i mean yeah. if you want to you know do, is there is is that real do, or? I, do i believe that sure i believe that. yeah yeah, I mean, there's a verse in the Bhagavad Gita that says, uh, 
those who pursue their yogic practice, their spiritual discipline, to a particular point in one lifetime, but who don't complete that course for whatever reason, it stops up, they're detoured, uh, they become disenchanted, whatever reason. Um, in their next birth, they pick up, if you make a 50% progress on your path this life and your next life, you'll start at 51%. It's, it's, it's never lost. Um, and uh, so there was some acknowledgement of uh, something familiar when I met my teacher, Bhaktivedanta Swami, back in 1969. We're not you know, directly addressing your questions, either about business or the Holocaust, <laughs> but um, it, it is the background to the answers to those questions. Yeah. So uh, I don't mind describing this for you. Yeah. So describe that for me. Take me back to 1969. You know, to me, uh, the 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 answers we get to the answers, and but it's the it's the backstory of that shapes the answers. So that's what that's what I love. <laughs> now and, now uh, you're talking like a good screenwriter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so take me back to 1969, right? So you. Yeah. Um, I'm, I am a believer of past lives, a book that, that changed, uh, my perspective on all of that and, and rocked my world. Um, I'm going to, I'm 49 right now. I'll be 50 next year. So I think I read it 25, 26, 27 years ago it was Brian Weiss's many lives, many masters. That was the, um, and then talking to heaven. I read after that by James Van Prague and it began to open, it began a journey for me to understand past lives, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And um, and what we bring into this lifetime from past lives, mm -hmm. and so that has been a that has been a continual journey uh, for me. So now take me back to your 1969, right? You come in, you come into this world, right? Things feel familiar, and now 1969 comes. And the seed has been replanted. You know, take me, take me there, take me from there. <laughs> well, uh, I was studying literature at the Sorbonne in Paris, and on the Christmas break in '69, I went to London, the holiday break. Someone had said, um, "Why don't you go visit the the Krishna Ashram there? It's a beautiful temple." So I did. It was off Oxford Street, beautiful building with them. Um, a lovely altar and deities of Radha and Krishna. I mean, it was exquisite. And uh, they were serving a vegetarian lunch, so I sat down. They asked me about myself. It was a group of maybe 12 or 15 young men and women in uh, robes and face, you know, traditional tilak face marking. And um, I said, I'm a student in Paris. And, and I play organ in a student band. As soon as I said that, th their eyes got big. So, whoa, come with us. So we scurry up the stairs. They throw me into their Volkswagen minibus, which was the most dangerous vehicle that's ever been allowed on the streets. <laughs> and we start rocking and rolling down Oxford Street. And I say, where are we going? They say, you'll see. We show up. They open the van door. And there's a, this is an elegant street. I look at a street sign. It says Savile Row. And we're looking at a door with a number three on it. Anyone from... My era, you know, the post-war baby era, knew that Three Savile Row was Beatles headquarters. I'm thinking, okay, what's going on here? We walk in the door, go downstairs, and it's the Apple Studios recording room, and there's George Harrison standing there. And they talk to him a little bit, and um, he walks over and says, so I understand you play organ. So he hands me a harmonium with this little Indian hand-pumped keyboard instrument. And he says, um, you know, just, just play along. You know, they were recording an album of Indian devotional music. So I'm sitting away, you know, picking up on the melody and jamming on this harmonium. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, if I stay with these people, I get God and the Beatles. So. <laughs> Not okay, bad. Yeah, I'm in. <laughs> And uh, I ended up staying in Ashram for 13 years and then came back. I was 32 
I, you know, I lost that whole decade. Whatever happened in the 70s, Bruce Springsteen, I have no idea. <laughs> Came back and um, went looking for work and found work in a children's film studio. So I got my feet into the film business, doing documentary films, uh, working with children's picture books and making animated films for them. I love that. Then uh, segued into documentaries when I married. And my, as I mentioned, my father-in-law introduced me to the Yale Holocaust video archive. And then um, started writing biographies of survivors. So that's kind of a bit of the linear trajectory. Yeah, yeah no, that's amazing. When you were in the ashram, you said, oh, I've, I've got the Beatles and I've got, right? Tell me about your relationship with God during that time. Well, the Beatles and God were very often confused for one another <laughs> back in those days. So, yeah. Um, I didn't have a relationship with God. I was raised in a very agnostic, secular, you know, home. I mean, my mom was fantastic. She was my best friend. I liked your description of your relationship with your mom. You know? This yeah. was a, a being who came into the world and who played this role to perfection. Yeah. And now that being has moved on. And, and whether in a woman's body or man's body, I have no idea. But that person, uh, I wish Godspeed. You know, yeah. it's, uh, did a great job with me. Um, Since you believe so, in... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, no, I mean, bottom line is it was the 60s, you know, 69, 70. And the world was just in a state of turmoil and, and young people were looking for all kinds of alternative paths. And so moving it into, into an ashram, chanting on beads, becoming vegetarian, all that stuff really wasn't such a stretch. Yeah. But it wasn't about God. I mean, to this day, I don't consider myself religious. I'm not a religious person. God, I find dangerous. Krishna and the notion of bhakti and the idea of consciousness as having a personal dimension, I'm all over that. Yeah, let's yeah, talk that, about that. Yeah, let's talk about consciousness. I, I'm a big believer that, um, you know, the same level of consciousness that gets you to where you are cannot get you to where you want to be. And we're all, I can't say we're all, I know I am, and I think many people are, um, whether they're conscious of it or not, you know, always looking to grow their level of awareness, their frequency, their vibration, their their level of consciousness. And so how have you, you know, tapped into that? And, and what is raising your consciousness mean to you? And how, and I'm gonna ask you a kind of a three-pronged question. And, and how do you incorporate that into your books, into your writing? Uh, nice bridge. <laughs> uh, you know, growing up uh, with, as an only child of a single mother had advantages and it had disadvantages. And um, there was a certain insecurity about myself. There was no positive male role model. And so, you know, I grew up with certain uncertainties about myself. I wasn't quite sure what my worth was or my direction. Uh, and, it's, and that was very good because it meant I was open-minded. Yeah. Uh, I, I could explore things. And my mom, bless her heart, was, you know, encouraging that. She said, you know, as long as you're not hurting yourself or anybody else, journey forth, you know, yeah. go, find, go find out what, what's your bliss, you know, find out what, what turns you on. And, uh, where I am now, that was more than a half century ago. I'm 71 now. Over the course of that time, what I've learned is a life well lived is a life lived in truth, in honesty, with impeccable motive, with greater concern for the well being of others than for oneself, mm -hmm. and with an ability to say, I have my particular covenant with divinity, but that doesn't make me wrong and somebody me right and somebody else wrong. Everyone has their particular path that they're pursuing. Yeah. And that took me a long time to get to that point of not proselytizing. Yeah. Of not wanting to convince somebody of any. This is something that comes up in discussion with my brother all the time. My brother, Brian Green, is a very well-known physicist. 
And uh, I mean, I, I'm mesmerized by his work. He's written a number of best-selling books on string theory and the, the future of the universe and so on. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful speaker, wonderful writer. And when I look up at the night sky, when, what I see has been enhanced by his work. It's amazing. Um, where I can't go along with him is his conclusion that if you follow the physics far enough, you'll be able to find the origins of consciousness. That I, that I can't follow. Uh, I, I don't see that the thing that makes us uniquely who we are, and now we're going to get to Siggy, is nothing more than a history of particles and wave forces and, and functions and energies interacting until they become self-aware. I'm, I have a hard time em embracing that. Yeah. Um, there's a, I, I think that can lead to some very dark places and it does. Yeah. And, you know, you don't have to become, you know, a mantra chanting deity worshiping, you know, vegetarian yogi to be open to the idea that, that life is permanent. Yeah. That, that there's something more than the experiences of this one moment, this one frame in a series of frames that we call lives. Yeah. Uh, and yet, I think because anything that has to do with that tends to get bunched in with religion and faith and, and, and mysticism and, and, and things that have not been, have not done well historically. Yeah. Rational people just would prefer the, the physics particle theory. Yeah. You know, that we're nothing but matter. There is nothing but matter in the universe. And any references to transcendent, transcendent causes, multiple, you know, many lifetimes, a, a permanent self that evolves is, has no place in that. I have a hard time with that. Yeah. No, I hear you on that. Mm. Wow. Smart family. So now, now, if you Smart. want to ask me why I wrote about Siggy, I'll tell you. I, I, I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to, I want to, I want to talk about your books. I have, I have, I have one more question about some of the stuff we just talked about, because, um, as a, as a business coach, I hear from a lot of people, um, who have a difficult time understanding kind of what their worth is. And so you had made a comment that you were trying to figure that out. What was that path like? And when did you figure it out? over the course of many years of practice, you know, how do you get to Nirvana? Practice, practice, practice. Right. Um, That's what my father-in-law says to my kids when we're, when we've been to New York with him, Hey kids, how do you get to Carnegie hall? Practice, practice, practice. Yeah. Chant, chant, chant. <laughs> um, it, it's a slow process. You know, we've been transmigrating a very long time. You know, the conditioning runs deep. Don't expect uh, epiphanies overnight. Yeah. Um, look, I, I, I've been asked to talk about this stuff in workplaces. I've spoken at Microsoft. I've spoken at Bank of New York. I taught at the Zarb School of Business at Hofstra. So meditation as a, as, a, as a tool of enlightened business practice. Uh, and, you know, when I go into workplaces, what I find is people who are terrified to speak up and say what they know. Uh, who will not criticize or offer constructive suggestions because they're worried about being marginalized or laughed at or heaven forbid lose their job, you know, at a time when you know, people are trying so desperately to pay bills and just keep it all together. Yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, <laughs> corporations will pay a lot of money for you know a guy like me to come in and tell them things that the people around them could have told them if they were just willing to listen and yeah and 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 not marginalize people who are willing to talk speak up um and i find that the people who do well 
in a work environment are people who have very good self-reflective skills, self-analytical skills, who aren't afraid to say, hmm, I don't know. Yeah. Let's find out. Let's find out together. Um, and for myself, I have discovered that that is greatly facilitated by a refreshed vision of myself and who I am. Yeah. You know, that there's a part of me that is not material, if you will. There's a part of me that is not the product of my particulate history. <laughs> you know, that uh, there are traumas and sadnesses in life, but they don't have to define who we are. Mm. So well said. Easy, sometimes hard in the, the, the living each day until you get there, but so well said. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's talk about your books. Let's talk about your books. Um, you've written a ton of them. Um, I'm, we're gonna, we're, we're, we're gonna talk about Unstoppable right now, your latest book, but, um, you've written many, many books for children, um, entertainment, nonfiction, um, you've written spiritual books, uh, Swami in the Strange Land, uh, Here Comes the Sun about George Harrison, uh, Gita Wisdom, uh, uh, for adults, Holocaust history, Witness, Voices from the Holocaust, uh, Justice at... What is it? Dachau. 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 Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I mean, I know Dachau, but my phonics is horrible. So, uh, and now your latest book, um, Unstoppable. And so, you know, there's so many um, different ways that people have and continue to write about the Holocaust. I'm, I, 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 I really would love to know how you landed on writing about Siggy. What, what, what got you to him in particular? Uh, his was a story that I had not encountered before, even though I've screened maybe 100 or 120 video testimonies by Holocaust survivors and have done biographies of maybe eight or, eight or nine. Um, none exuded the joy for life that I found in Siggy. None ha had the same capacity for not only speaking about the darkness that he had gone through, but channeling that darkness into a, a tool that can, could help others. I'll give you some examples. Yeah. First of all, <laughs> He loved the life so much that you know, he'd gone through two years in Auschwitz, forced labor, you know, a dozen selections for death, two death marches. He was 88 pounds when they, the American forces liberated him from Mauthausen. And he came here and just became such a big success. He was a volcano of a guy, five short, five foot five, but a volcano, explosive personality. He would stand up in, in the middle of restaurants and start singing and dancing. You know? People would elbow his kids saying, you know, was your father owned the restaurant? And no, he just loves life. When he passed away in 2003, he left behind him a, an oil and banking empire with more than $4 billion in assets. And he would stop everything. A guy who had no time for anything except work. If he heard that someone was sick or needed help there was a the he heard that the son of one of his bank employees was suicidal he had his driver take him to the guy's house and sat with the kid all day long said, look, you know, and then told him his stories he says, look this is what i went through you think you've got a bad let me tell you about Auschwitz." and you know the the body the impression that people got was if he can go through what he went through and come out loving his life so much and taking joy in helping other people and, and doing what he can to support the, the state of Israel and, and Holocaust education. And, and uh, you know, just every day was a celebration of some kind. Maybe I can too. So we need role models, you know, character and that kind of positive behavior is in pretty short supply these days. 
So I thought his his life was a story worth telling. Yeah. How can we, you know, as as we sit here recording this, it it doesn't feel like COVID is is still around, but it is. And 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 I think sometimes people are having a hard time today. I hear this from a lot of people that I talk to. I hear this from clients. I hear this from people I interview. They're having a hard time finding joy, right? Finding joy. The um, the Atlantic recently um, wrote an article. Um, it's called "What If the Thing You're Waiting For Never Arrives." It's it's basically an article that talks about the play um, "Waiting for Godot." I think it's Godot. Uh, uh, Godot. Godot, yeah. excuse me, mm-hmm. um, where, you know, it's, a, it's this play about two, um, you know, two guys kind of at the side of a road and, you know, getting irritated because what they're waiting for never comes. And it's talking about how um, the Delta variant and COVID is getting people kind of in that space and it's hard for them to find joy. And so what would what would Siggy advise us to do today? to find joy in kind of a COVID slash post COVID world? Uh, I think the first thing that he might say is, uh, why are you focusing on the sad stuff? Mm-hmm. He, he was, he, this wasn't a particular uh, uh, ism. He had a lot of ism's, but he might've said something to the effect of, you know, uh, in a, in, a, in a beehive, there's lots of holes, but there's also a lot of honey. Uh, why don't you look for the honey? Yeah. Um, he, he, he wanted people to understand that you're under no compulsion to give in to the sadness. That uh, if you'll just lift your head up, off the ground, uh-huh. you know, you're going to see sky up there. He tells a story um, when he, after he was liberated from the camps, as a gesture of thanks to the American liberation forces, he joined the U.S. Counterintelligence Corps. Now, that was the, the group that Simon Wiesenthal was a part of that went hunting for Nazis who had fled the camps and were hiding out in villages and forests and so on. And his job for the CIC took him on his first plane ride. And Siggy describes getting on the plane. He was, what, 20 years old. And uh, it was a rainy, cloudy, dreary day, a miserable day. The The plane took off and climbed, pierced through the cloud bank into the brightest sky you could ever imagine. It was a beautiful bright blue sky and a shining sun. And Siggy said, you know, in in the camps, people were so horrified by what they had to see. They often wondered, is is there even a God? You know, maybe if there was a God, he left. He's not interested in us anymore. Siggy said, when that plane broke through those clouds and I saw that bright, beautiful sun, my faith was, was confirmed. And he said, it was the Almighty speaking to me. And he was yeah. saying, don't despair. Sometimes a dark cloud like Hitler comes between us, but I'm still here. I am still here. Yeah. He might tell that story to that yeah. sad person you're talking about. That's powerful. You know, um, he seemed to have um, such a positive mindset and outlook on things. And I think, you know, there's, it's kind of like there's three types of people in the world. You know, there's people that um, they think everything happens, you know, to them, which is kind of that victim mentality for them, which is very ego. And then through them, which is more kind of universal, right? Surrendering to you know, the, the energies of the universe. It sounds like he was able to not be a victim um, from what I'm hearing from you, that he could really kind of compartmentalize that piece of his life. And now he was, to put it in your words, unstoppable. And so how was he able to 
stay so joyful? And how did he get back to center when he wasn't? Okay, well, the, if you just read the story in terms of its basic plot line, you know, it, it, it's a success story. It's a hero story. It's yeah. a David and Goliath epic story. You know, you've got this little guy comes out of the worst time in history, bulldozes his way to the top of the mountain and becomes this fabulous success in, in banking and, and oil and gas. It's happy story, right? Along with that, simultaneously, there's this subterranean narrative, which is the death story. It's the story of what he came out of. Siggy never shed his nightmare. He had nightmares all his life. Some of them were about what he'd been through, what he'd seen. Some of them were the mind brewing its own poisonous concoctions. He would dream of his own children, seeing his children walking into the crematorium fires. Um, so that never went away. What he managed to do <laughs> in, in the, in the uh, Sanskrit terminology we call Pratipaksha Bhavana. <laughs> means taking something and turning it around. So there's a sadness, I turn that around and it becomes an energy, like you're saying, through me. Yeah. An energy that he would channel in a way. So it, it wasn't that the nightmares lost their horror, but after a while he knew what they were. Mm -hmm. I think I think the mistake that some people make, I know from teaching in yoga studios, people who take yoga make a lot of them make this mistake. They think it yoga is a cure-all. That somehow I'm gonna do this and my life's gonna go away. <laughs> you know, it's all gonna go away. The journey is not running away. The journey is going deeper inside the experiences of your life with the training the background that will allow you to confront those challenges more effectively. Yeah. That's enlightenment. That's the journey. That's the moving toward the fulfillment of our life. It's Joe Campbell's monomyth. You know, it's the search for the Holy Grail. It's the Jason and the Golden Fleece. It's it, you know it's it's going into the belly of the whale and having to turn that around and come out revitalized. So uh, it's it's hard to swallow, but those tough moments are under the right circumstances if handled properly. Um, grist for the mill they're they're yeah. they're, they're, they're they're food for a, a kind of an unfolding that takes place now please don't misunderstand me if you're in a abusive partnership you know don't think oh well god wants me here because this is what's going to make me grow get the heck out of there <laughs> right becoming a martyr isn't spiritual it's stupid yeah so there's a, 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 a note of objectivity and realism that needs to be kept in mind here. Yeah, well said. But if properly guided, this is where the teacher comes in, the guru, the, the, someone who can help you kind of figure it all out. It can, you can get through it. It can be yeah. done. And, and that's why I wanted to sell Siggy's story. Somehow, you know, without chanting mantras or, you know, becoming vegetarian or practicing yoga or whatever. He, he found that. He found that path out of the forest. Um, and again, not that it ever left him, but he was quite a guy. Yeah. What's his legacy today to those who knew him or to even those who didn't know him? Oh, that's an easy question to answer. The, teach the Holocaust. Study the Holocaust. Don't forget the Holocaust. Uh, as soon as you do, you open the door to all kinds of horrors returning to visit us again. You remember the footage from January 6th? Of course. The, the, the insurrectionists with T-shirts that said Camp Auschwitz. Mm, you know, horrible. This isn't ancient history. You know, this is front page news, this stuff. 
the anger and the, the hatred and the fear that have precipitated the tragedies that we've seen over the last few years come about because of an, an uncertainty over the things we don't understand. It's a, it's a really big moment in history right now to practice yogic breathing, you know, just like, let's chill out, you know, let's, let's bring the fever down, you know, right. and start talking again. Um, Siggy was good for that. He, yeah. he was good for getting people talking. What did, um, what did he teach you personally? Hmm. Um, that I could go back into this arena and not have to be afraid of it. I, I had, I was done with the Holocaust. I did too many documentary films, too many books. I didn't want that anymore. The, the George Harrison biography, well, I was running around the house with my chin on the ground and my wife says to me, you got to find something else to write about. I said, like what? So she says, well, you always have nice things to say about George. Why don't you write a book about him? So I did. And that made me feel better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I discovered was that it was possible to go back into this arena and and not die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, tell me about the name of the book. You know, I, I, I always love a good name. And so, you know, how you kind of sum something up, you know, in, in just a word, right? And, um, you know, tell me about the name. What, one of the, um, one of my institutions is in life is a, is a uh, Bhakti poet, a devotional poet from the 1600s. His name was Rupa Goswami. Rupa Goswami in his poetry describes love. And he says, if all the evidence says this has to stop now, and, but you can't and you move forward and, and it grows deeper and richer, that's love. And so it's, it's working against all of the elements. It, it, it's going the extra distance. Yeah. Tell me, um, you know, this book got you back into the arena, but when you um, finished chapter 26 um, and you wrote your last word and you sent the, tran you know, the manuscript, the transcript to the, to the editor, the publisher, et cetera, what was it like finishing this piece of art? Hmm. Uh, when I first got into this horrible line of work, um, a very well-known editor said to me, be prepared to not like anything you do ever again. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think an artist, an honest artist, or anyone working in any particular creative capacity, um, generally looks at the defects in what they've done. Of course, the, the irony in it is that most people never see those defects. They don't even know they're there. Uh, we can be our own harshest critics. So I sent it in and then immediately thought I, it wasn't ready to send in. Um, and true to form, uh, it went through a lot of revisions, even after it was set in galleys, you know, you find things, how did I miss that? How did I miss that? I missed that. But in general, I was happy because the, the intent was to offer people something that would be inspiring, that would say, we humans are capable of such extraordinary things 
having gone through the darkest of times, yeah. having gone through circumstances that from a distance, you would say it's impossible to survive that. Yeah. And yet life perseveres. You know, what, there's something so magnificent about the human state. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's good to be reminded of that. What an amazing, um, you know, journey you have been on and continue to be on. And, you know, so let's go back for a minute to that yoga studio where people kept on asking you questions. And you thought to yourself, I don't have the answer. So take me to one of those students that asked you a question. How would you answer that today? If the question was, you have such a beautiful view of a purposeful creation, how do you reconcile that with what happened in Europe 80 years ago? Correct. Have you found the I, answer? I've, well, I've, I've found a cliche. Yeah. Um, or if you will, a short form answer. Um, and it is that when we turn away from our true nature, when we turn away from our true self, we can fall very, very, very far. Yeah. When we turn toward our true nature, we can soar very, very high. Mm. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Um, everybody can buy the book on Amazon, uh, as well as all of your other books. Um, tell everybody um, one thing. You know, we've talked about your journey, Siggy's. What do you want your legacy to be a hundred years from today? Well, you really do expect a lot on a first day. <laughs> I a um, hundred years from now. I, I hope I just I've disappeared from the scene. Um, I I don't think I'm all that special. I don't I don't really don't think there's anything that you know I have to preserve in stone <laughs> for some reason. Yeah. Um, you know, the books will be around and I, I think they may be of some value to some people. And, yeah. and that's that's a consolation, if you will, to our mortality. Yeah. Um, no, I, I'm I'm comfortable. I, I'm I have no like my mom, I guess I have no regrets. You yeah. Know? I have two wonderful kids. I'm surrounded by the love of my family. Yeah. Tell me about your family. Well, my wife is a retail executive. And uh she has the only key to the closet where my old monastery robes and beads are hanging. <laughs> um, my son is a uh, marvelous, marvelous, marvelous soul who is a pilot for Southwest Airlines. Um, he's 42. Uh, our daughter is 31. She is finishing a PhD in philosophy. Where she got that idea from, I have no idea. <laughs> um, and. Uh, And the flowers outside my window in the spring are beautiful. And I don't know what else I can tell you. Yeah. You can, <laughs> you can answer this last question for me. Um, what's your favorite book behind you? Mine is your own. Hmm. Um, that, that question, which comes up a lot, um, is a river in motion. Uh, you know, it depends on the mood. It depends. It's like asking what kind of music do you like? Depends what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, I like jazz. I like blues. You know, I love uh, classical. You know, it depends yeah. on what's going depends on. Depends on the day. I get it. What do you do for fun? Dance. Uh, I'm not a good dancer, but I enjoy it. Good. And uh, what else? Take walks with my dear wife. Nice. Um, and uh, have conversations with nice people like you. Yeah, well, thanks. Um, <laughs> I'd love this conversation. Um, I think you, um, Joshua, define uh, humility, which um, I think is a characteristic that is not seen enough, you know, right today, uh, especially with social media and things of that nature. 
Um, and I appreciate you sharing your journey and I appreciate you doing soulful work because this, this work is, this work is tough work to dive into the arena and, and dive into the stories, uh, and dive into, um, the heartache and the horror, um, and somehow find the sunshine in it. Uh, so people can never forget and also, find empowerment in it. To me, it is absolutely spectacular. Um, I am very grateful and appreciative for meeting you and for you taking time to talk to me and my um, Think Business community. And um, I think, you know, I would end uh, this talk, um, you know, many, many, many years ago. I've always, I've always evolved my career based on fulfillment. And um, I was at a point in my life where I needed to start my own business. And I was really, really nervous to do it, the business that I have now. And so my business coach at the time, who was a, and just an amazing human being, he passed away a few years ago. Um, he introduced me to an attorney. And I went to just go talk to this attorney as a, as a mentor, not any legal type stuff. And uh, as I was leaving, I think the first time and he was, and, and, and as I was leaving, I literally, I can visualize myself like going to the door and he said, Hey, John, I have one more thing to tell you. If you do nothing, you'll regret it for the rest of your life. And so in that moment was the moment I made my decision because I never wanted to look back with regret. So the energy of your mom and, and, uh, is that such sage advice to be able to, I think people have a very difficult time making decisions in life. And so to make a decision where you can maybe fast forward and then look at your life in hindsight to, to, to make decisions and move with no regrets is a beautiful gift. She gave you, she gave everybody that resonated from her and from you and, um, and reinforces it for me. So thank What's her name? Adele. Adele. Thank you, Adele. Um, and thank you, Joshua. I really, I appreciate your time. And um, uh, to, to the Think community, um, if you go to Joshua M. Green, J-O-S-H-U-A-M-G-R-E-E-N-E -E -E dot info, you can see all of uh, Joshua's books, all of his films, everything. We'll also have everything in the show notes. And um, Thank you so much. I, I, uh, I'm very grateful. Thank you.